uh, today we are going to go through the chapter on uh, field I'll try to keep it very short and then go through a couple of problems in the notebooks uh, and uh, so uh, the book starts with uh, an introduction to complex numbers and uh, uh, so I I the notation of I in complex numbers is defined as something that solves x square equal to minus 1 so uh, I I square is defined as minus 1 and uh, also so if for example you have a equation like this so uh, nothing squares to a negative number but here you can have one of the solutions is 1 plus 3i the way i is defined you can have a solution like 1 plus 3i for x minus 1 square is equal to minus 9 okay uh, now uh, a real number uh, so here it just says a real number plus an imaginary number is a complex number a complex number can have a real part and an imaginary part so um, so this for example is a complex number one is the real part and three is the imaginary part uh, so uh, complex numbers in Python we'll go through some examples in the notebook uh, abstracting over fields so this is a great uh, concept because uh, what it says is once a fields there could be multiple fields so for example real numbers are a field complex numbers are a field and uh, 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 we'll get to a Galois field um, so uh, we could overload operators so uh, for example uh, uh, the plus operation in Python works for both real numbers and complex numbers and uh, so for example if we write a procedure solve it just returns X uh, given C B and A for example uh, in this equation A X plus B equal to C so uh, if, if we can solve and x plus 5 equal to 30 we can also solve a comp if if a is complex we can still solve it so that's that that's what is the intuition behind abstracting over fields so basically you can uh, the same uh, the same operations work over both uh, all types of fields and uh, th that's why you can use like for example the plus operator or the minus operator on complex numbers as well as as uh, real numbers so the results that are valid for real numbers are also valid for complex numbers um, so um, more on fields so a field it's trying to define a field so um, if the operation uh, uh, division is is uh, the inverse of multiplication uh, the operation uh, subtraction is the inverse of uh, addition and um, similarly uh, and and a lot of linear algebra is just based on these operations uh, plus minus multiplication and division and uh, uh, and it also assumes a field also assumes some things about these operations so for example it assumes that addition is commutative so a plus b is equal to b plus a always and it also assumes that multiplication distributes over addition so a multiplied by b plus c is a multiplied by b plus a multiplied by c so there are some more uh, but if you satisfy these if a system of numbers satisfies these operations then it's called a field and uh, uh, such a collection of and uh, and different fields like uh, are like different classes obeying the same interface it's it can be thought of as like uh, a different class of numbers or something else that have the same interface so let's the field is defined by this f uh, this kind of a notation f and uh, also uh, we study so here in this book we are we are mainly concerned with three fields one is the real number one the other one is the complex number and the other one that the book uh, goes through is gf2 which is galois field 2 which is uh, which consists of zero and one and addition subtraction uh, everything is defined modulo two so uh, i will get to more of it later but uh, c c is c is studied because 
C is very similar to R. Complex numbers are built into Python. And uh, complex numbers kind of are uh, the ancestors of vectors because they have like a real part and an imaginary part. So they're like, they can be thought of as a 2D vector. And uh, uh, there are some results. The complex numbers um, play an important role, uh, which, which will be in the next course. Sure. Complex numbers. Um, so complex numbers also have a real and imaginary part, so they can be thought of as a point in the in a in a two D two D plot where the y axis is the imaginary uh, value and the x axis is the real value. Uh, we'll go through this in the notebook. So the absolute value of a complex number is uh, the absolute value of z is uh, depicted as z as this. Uh, z between two bars and it's the length of z so this is the distance of from origin of z so this can this can be written in multiple ways so uh, one way to write it as is as uh, z multiplied by the conjugate of g z and also uh, uh, just the square of the imaginary and the real part so if you consider it as a triangle then it's z dot g dot imaginary square plus z dot real square and then you take a square root and that is the absolute value of z and uh, if you also do z multiplied by by the conjugate of z and if you uh, follow through the equation you'll get the same thing um, and in python you can always get it like this and uh, so adding complex numbers so if you for example have like a bunch of complex numbers here and you add 1 plus 2i to it then addition or translation as it's called here will move all points by one in the real dimension and two in the complex dimension so that's also sometimes referred to as translation and uh, then adding complex numbers uh, you translate it can also be interpreted as translation and uh, and a translation can move a picture like to anywhere like um, you want to take a set of points you can move it to anywhere else through translation adding complex numbers and uh, uh, so for example here uh, so here we see that this this point this point get translated to this point so if this point is 2 plus 2i then uh, left i is 2 plus 2i then the translation is by minus 2 minus 2i so if you add minus 2 minus 2i to all the points then this whole uh, face will move to this position okay so let's go to the next one uh, adding complex numbers complex numbers as arrows the camp uh, complex numbers can also be uh, visualized as um, uh, arrows in the complex plane and where the tail of the arrow is anywhere in the complex plane arrows head uh, anywhere z let's suppose the head will become z plus z naught so kind of the complex number is only giving the direction and the uh, value not the origin uh, so here z plus z naught if you see z is a point uh, in the complex plane if you add z naught to it then you reach z naught plus c so um, the real parts get added and the imaginary parts get added. Similarly, adding complex numbers uh, represent my uh, example represent minor as an arrow. So here, uh, if we have to represent minus six plus five i, right? So so if you minus six, so x direction you go from so uh, so something like uh, I'll put right here uh, something like six to zero and um, no five to zero wait, minus six so x x comes down by six whereas y goes um, so it will be in this direction so x goes down by six whereas y goes down by five so it will be something like it can start here and go here or it can start here and go here. It can start at the origin and go to 
uh, minus 6 comma 5 so here minus 5 so origin to minus 6 comma 5 right now minus 6 minus 6 comma oh, sorry we will start at origin and go minus 6 minus 6 and 5i so it will go in this direction I about that we will go in this direction from minus 6 plus 5i mm, okay so the, again minus 6 plus 5i is starts from the origin goes to minus 6 plus 5i so right here so this is the if, if, if it starts somewhere else it will still go in this direction okay adding complex numbers uh, consider two complex numbers um, they correspond to uh, two complex two translations so if, if you add it with z they will go from z if, if, uh, if you do a functional composition then uh, or for addition then it will be z plus z1 plus z2 uh, represent functional composition by adding arrows so if you for example have two complex numbers and then you add them together and it becomes a translation by 5 plus 4i so instead of like uh, com if you compose these two translations first a translation by z1 and then a translation by z2 it will become a translation by 5 plus 4i uh, multiplying by complex numbers so you just add so the arrow just scales by the number you are multiplying it with uh, so if you multiply it by 0.5 then the arrow just scales down by 0.5 so if you multiply this by 0.5 then it will be half the length So uh, let's go here. Uh, if you if you multiply by minus one, it changes direction. It has the same same uh, 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 same size, but it changes direction. Okay. Uh, rotation by i. So this is a good one. If you if you take a vector, if you take a complex number and multiply it by i, then what if you take x plus y i? then it becomes x i minus y so if you so what does it become so if, if it was like for example 1 comma 1 let's suppose uh, then what would it become uh, it will become uh, 1 comma minus 1 right so uh, this becomes 1 wait no minus 1 comma 1 because the real part is minus 1 now so this will become this will get uh, minus 1 comma 1 so 1 comma 1 becomes minus 1 comma 1 so in effect it got rotated by 90 degrees so that's why what multiplication by i does it rotates it by 90 degrees so argument and angle so argue so if you for example see all complex numbers in the unit circle so if you take the complex plane and then you draw a unit circle from your origin then uh, all the complex numbers on it uh, if you consider then argument is basically if you take a z it's the angle from from origin or or it's the angle or it's the distance on the circumference that is covered by someone moving from this point to that point in the counterclockwise direction so that's what the argument of z is so um, uh, mm, you can also think of it as an angle same thing because angle is defined by the distance divided by the radius and the radius is, it's a unit circle so the radius is one so the distance is same as the angle um, and in two dimensions uh, so yeah. okay also one interesting result is the Euler's formula, which uh, e, e to the power of theta i uh, for any real number theta is, for, uh, he says, e to the power of theta i is this z. So z can also be written as e to the power of theta i. So the way I understood it, understand it is like if you write the um, the expansion of e. And if you take uh, a uh, then it becomes sine theta plus i cos theta. 
So that that way it becomes easy. So if you if you draw two lines here, and this is cos theta, and this is sine theta. So then this z becomes cos theta plus i sine theta. So that's what and e to the power of i theta also expands to cos theta plus i sine theta. So that's why uh, you can also depict this z by e to the power of theta i. Okay. Same thing, e to the power, uh, if you plug in pi for theta, then it becomes what? e to the power of pi i, um, pi i, which is cos, cos pi plus i sine pi. i sine pi is 0 and cos pi is minus 1, so it becomes minus 1. So this is this is just plotting the circle. A rotation by tau radians. So if you rotate a, a, a complex number by tau radians, then you are basically multiplying it by e to the power of tau i. So um, this is this is a greater than any complex number. So any complex number can be represented as uh, so first you scale it down to the unit circle by r. So if you multiply by r, so so you know uh, it becomes it comes down to unit circle. So if you take this this z, and if it was not on the unit circle, then you would first scale it down by multiplying it by r for it to come to the unit circle, and then you can represent it as e to the power of i theta. So any complex number can be represented as r e to the power of i theta. And uh, now you. Uh, now, if you if you need to rotate the, you, you need to keep the thing constant, but just rotate by uh, by an argument uh, by by an argument. Then you write it. Then you can. How how would you achieve no, uh, like like e to, e to the power of tau i will take for example one and rotate it by tau. So. Um, so it can take any complex number and rotate it by tau. So, it, well, this is here. So it will take any complex number and rotate it. So its scale remains the same, but it gets rotated by tau. So uh, that's what this. Now we come to Galois fields. So. The way the law field is defined is it has just two elements, 0 and 1. And the way all its operations are defined modulo 2. So plus is defined uh, in this table as if you define it modulo 2, then 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 0 is zero, 1. 1 plus 1 is 0 because 1 plus 1 modulo of 2 is 0. So um, similarly, multiplication, same thing. Multiplication modulo never comes into picture. So, so then this becomes zero zero uh, zero one. So it's the same as integer multiplication. But if you think about a division and uh, subtraction, then uh, instead of so you can have this idea of a multiplicative inverse and a additive inverse. So even in modulo two, you can have uh, so if you think about uh, what is the additive inverse of 1? So what, the additive inverse of 1 is the number when added to 1 becomes takes it to 0. So additive inverse of 1 is 1 and additive inverse of 0 is 0. So addition is same as subtraction for exclusive or for, for this GF2. Uh, is, but um, division is division is not defined for 0. So uh, 0 0 divided by 1 is defined, 1 divided by 1 is defined, by, but nothing divided by 0 is similar to <coughs> real numbers. Uh, division is just a multiplication with the multiplicative inverse and the multiplicative inverse of <coughs> oh, sorry. multiplicative inverse of 0 is not defined. So that's why uh, you cannot, but it's the same as real numbers and all that all the operations, all, all the results valid for real numbers could also be valid for the law fields. So uh, you can you can import uh, one and zeros from GF2 library. Okay, so now we are trying to do use GF2 and uh, create a, a encryption system. So, 
Alice and Bob, they decide uh, beforehand a secret key K and they have this table. And Alice enters a plain text P and uh, using K it comes up with a cipher text and sends it to Bob and Bob can look at C and tell what P was. P is the plain text, C is the cipher text. So um, can Bob uniquely descript, uh, decrypt the cipher text? Yes, because because addition has a you can you can have an inverse operation in uh, so you, you it's one to one and on to so it's uh, it, it goes um, no but it uh, but given given p and k uh, the c that comes out you can uh, if you know, know k, then you can get the p back. So, uh, yeah. So if you, uh, so that's how it, you can decrypt it. So, for example, if you know k is one, then if you know k is one, then this function you will only consider the rows two and four. Then it's a one-to-one -one function. 0 goes to 1, 1 goes to 0, right? So it's a 1 to 1 function and it's an on to function. So that's why it's invertible. Um, and, and if you know k is 0, then it's again uh, the rows 1 and 3 come into picture. So it's again 1 to 1 and on to. So it's it's uh, invertible. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, does, Eve, does Eve learn anything about the value of p? So mm, if c is equal to 0, then Eve uh, it doesn't know, um, it, it can't tell uh, whether, even if Eve can see the ciphertext, even if she can see that it's a zero, she cannot tell anything about P because P could be zero or one depending on K. So she doesn't have any, any information. Uh, and uh, if, if the ciphertext K is chosen at like a uniform probability of half, then it doesn't chosen by uh, then then she cannot unless she knows that you know k is being chosen more often k is zero than one then she could say something but otherwise she couldn't say anything about about p given c uh, i think i think i just explained it the uh, that this function if you remove those if you remove if you fix a k uh, if you uh, F zero K encryption uh, encryption of P is equal to zero, or if you fix P, uh, then if you fix P is equal to zero, then this is uh, uh, this is again a one to one onto function. And similarly, if you fix P is equal to one, this is a, from K to C is a one to one onto function. So given C, it cannot tell anything about uh, about uh, about P. Because if probability of if probability of k is equal to zero and probability of k is equal to half, k is equal to one is half, then you can prove that probability of uh, the ciphertext is also both half, and it does not depend on the plain text at all as long as the key is chosen at random. So you cannot tell anything about the plain text given the ciphertext. So that's what perfect secrecy is. Here is some historical. Uh, perspective about it that this but the one thing is that you should not reuse that key to encrypt multiple things because then it breaks out break then this thing breaks so if you for example have uh, this table if you uh, encrypt like uh, if you choose k is equal to uh, if you choose like a long list of things with the same k like if you choose k and you just decrypt encrypt one bit it's perfect secrecy but if you choose k and you you encrypt 100 bits with it then it's not perfect secrecy because then um, they can learn things about uh, about your crypto system um, so that that's what uh, that's what the soviets did in 1940s and uh, they reused some bits of the keys and that's that's was that was used to do some uh, espionage, like some spy stuff. Okay, let's come to network coding. So network coding, this this one I'll go through very quickly, and it's very intuitive. 
So let's suppose you have to send uh, all these channels can send one megabyte per second. But uh, and if you have to get two megabytes per second at C, uh, so let's come to this picture. So if you have to send two megabytes to, per second to C, it's fine. You just send it one megabyte this way and one megabyte this way, and C gets it. But let's suppose you want to send two megabyte per second to both C and D, and the trick is like your inner nodes can do a little bit of computation. Then how could you do that? So there's a neat trick to do, do that. You basically send B1 and B2, and you send uh, you send you uh, B1 gets here, B1 bit plus B2 gets here, right? And and this is Galois, uh, yeah, like B1 let's suppose is uh, a set of bits, and B2 is a set of bits, and you all the additions are like over, uh, in the Galois field, uh, so they are all invertible. So that so B1 goes one megabyte per second is coming here, and one megabyte per second of B1 plus B2 is coming here. So you just you take one megabyte of B, B1 per second, one megabyte of B2 per second, just do the Galois addition of it in, on this node, and then you pass it down. And now, because you know B1 and B1 plus B2, you can get B1 and B2. Because you just add B1 again on this one, B1 and B1 will, ca will cancel out, and then this will become B1. And, and similarly, D can take uh, B2 and B1 plus B2, add B2 again to B1 plus B2, it all again is getting B1 plus B2. So then both of them are getting B1 plus B2, uh, uh, even though, uh, which is 2 megabyte per second, even though the pipe is only 1 megabyte per second. So that's what we're going to So let, let, let me go back to some examples, some problems in, in, in the book. So, uh, so one thing that is, important to note is like uh, is that in, in Python complex numbers can be written as J so uh, right here complex numbers can be uh, expressed like this so just keep in mind that J in itself is a variable but when you write one J it becomes a complex number so uh, you have to make sure that you proceed it by a uh, number so then it becomes a complex number so that's that's how complex numbers are written uh, and uh, then here uh, there are some problems most of them are list comprehensions again filtering <coughs> one thing that could be useful is the reduce function from func tools uh, which will uh, reduce your uh, and there's a nice problem here where if you reuse the if you reuse the padding then uh, you you should try it on your own i i read that uh, it's it's problem one five one. You should try it on your own. How how you could decrypt a message, and uh, if you go through that and these problems, then uh, and the rest of the material, then that should be all the material for this class, for this chapter fields.